Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2014 fall semester graduate projects. Um, we in the city of Pittsburgh have been really fortunate to have a really strong partnership with the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University. Um, they've been uh, pivotal in terms of uh, providing a lot of good research and information to support a lot of our projects. and. Um, we'll have three presentations here this morning, um, and we'll have a short introduction before each presentation. Um, but really, thank you very much to Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you to the University of Pittsburgh um, for making this happen. Thanks, Director Lamb. I uh, appreciate the introduction. My name is Grant Irvin. I serve as a sustainability manager for the city of Pittsburgh. And it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our first presentation today the clean tech visions for a new Pittsburgh economy. This team was led by Dr. Sylvia Borzutsky from Carnegie Mellon University and the Heinz School. It was really uh, kind of an initiative that was led from an earlier roundtable that we hosted in the summer on the clean technology sector in Pittsburgh. What the students have done for us is really set forth a foundation with regards to uh, a, a new and emerging sector in Pittsburgh with regards to technologies that are cleaning and improving our environment. Everything from the building sector, building improvement, uh, or excuse me, building performance, clean energy, as well as software technologies that are being advanced right here in the city of Pittsburgh. So we're really excited uh, today to hear from the team, which is going to be led by Kenny Berry and Molly Brennan. So Kenny and Molly, if you want to join us up here and uh, kick off the presentations. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Molly Brennan. Uh, this is Kenny Berry, and we're gonna speak about clean technology in Pittsburgh. First, we're gonna introduce our team. Then I'm gonna t we're gonna talk about what clean technology means, and specifically what it means for Pittsburgh. Then we're gonna talk about the sector here and our recommendations that we have for the city. So we had a six-person team. Two of our other team members are here today, Meredith in the back and Tristan, and our faculty advisor is Sylvia over here, and of course, We've been thankful to work with Grant on this project. We found that there are four main recommendations that we have for the city after our research. First, we, we recommend that the city sits down and really considers what kind of scope they want to have on clean technology, what they want to focus on, how big they want this focus to be. <laughs> uh, second, create an Office of Strategic Investment, which we'll talk in detail about all of these at the end of the presentation. Third, su support Pittsburgh Clean Technology Greenhouse, and fourth, create local markets here in Pittsburgh to create more demand for clean technology products and services. Kenny. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so to start off, one of the uh, first things that we did early on in the semester was defining what clean technology really was. Other cities and regions have different definitions that fit with what their uh, strengths are and what, ma what makes sense for their region. And in Pittsburgh, we looked uh, for, first at a Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics definition, OECD, and uh, the Brookings Institution to see what they had, uh, what sort of framework they had laid out for us. And essentially, all of those definitions are saying the same thing, that these are technologies that help create a cleaner environment. And in Pittsburgh, uh, those three, I'll go over them slide by slide here. So the first one is uh, water technologies, uh, water products and services, and those are essentially technologies that create, improve water quality or efficiency. Uh, the second is uh, energy efficient building technologies. So any technology used in uh, building new or retrofitted that optimizes energy use. And the third is renewable energy and pollution control. And with each of these subsectors of clean technology here in Pittsburgh, we found that there is an existing uh, base of companies, organizations, and programs in place um, but there is certainly potential for better coordination between these, uh, between these stakeholders in these subsectors, and our recommendations help address those. So now I'll talk about uh, the research and methodologies that we used to arrive at those recommendations. Uh, the first and probably most important was um, speaking with people here in Pittsburgh and elsewhere um, about their thoughts on what a sector-based strategy for clean technology might actually mean. Uh, and that was anywhere from universities to accelerators to the city um, and economic development agencies uh, here in Pittsburgh. Second was seeing what 
was written about in literature review through uh, social science research. And finally, we looked at three cities in detail, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, and Portland, on strategies that they had employed and seeing which of those were transferable to uh, Pittsburgh, and those are reflected in the recommendations as well. And our framework started off, um, it's twofold. I'll be talking about our supply side recommendations, um, and those are your traditional economic development um, strategies, and then uh, the demand side of the equation, uh, which Molly will be talking about at the end. Um, some of those are a little bit more exciting and possibly easier to implement in the short term. And on the top, the traditional economic development ones again, um, firm attraction, expansion, and um, creation, how can, what is the role of public policy in incentivizing these? And at, at the bottom, what sort of requirements or incentives can the city put in place to help cr create markets for these products? So our first recommendation is, uh, again, Molly mentioned, to refine a cluster-based strategy. And the first component of this is to not select subsectors, but to see where industry in interest lies on this and which voices in industry are most interested um, in being better coordinated through these uh, later recommendations. Um, and we found with Milwaukee and Cincinnati, uh, two of our case study cities, that they had really drilled down on water technologies in focusing on a single specific subsector uh, that leveraged their existing regional comparative advantages. Um, the second part of it is to take a regional perspective. Uh, none of the cities that we looked at were successful unilater unilaterally in implementing their uh, initiatives. Um, in nearly all cases, they're either working with county or regional stakeholders, um, and in many cases had federal partners that were assisting in the implementation of this. And third, is to leverage ongoing initiatives and um, what the other priorities are for the city and how those can be paired with a sector-based economic development strategy. Um, and an important component of this is educating municipal employees on what it is that you're working on and uh, to look at what other cities have done in equivalent departments um, as part of these initiatives. Our second recommendation, um, so the second and third recommendation are two alternatives. Um, organizational recommendations for what the city could do um, in, in um, the first one is a two-phase scalable uh, sector-based strategy housed within the mayor's office um, that also addresses broader gaps in economic development functions within the city. And the second is a more distinct member-based organization that's coordinated by the city but not operated by the city, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so creating an office of strategic investment um, would the office would report directly to the mayor and um, be small and nimble with a flat organizational chart. And this office would also be responsible for linking existing strategies um, with other, with initiatives launched by this office. And some of these initiatives would include uh, consistently messaging and marketing the city's economic development objectives. Uh, currently there's no city counterpart to regional and county level economic development functions, but the city has recognized the need for this in creating a liaison to these groups um, within the URA, um, but more could be done. And a key responsibility within this would be ensuring that the city is closely connected with site selectors, the county, the conference, um, and the state on going the extra mile that's sometimes necessary to connect um, business attraction uh, decisions with the city. And uh, the second is that this office enables, gives, gives the city the capacity to implement cluster-based strategies like clean technology. Um, and uh, part of this is being able to assess uh, within the existing industry clusters, meaning the Water Economy Network, the Green Building Alliance, and the Energy Alliance of Greater Pittsburgh, where the interest is. And uh, some key responsibilities within this would be uh, branding the Pittsburgh clean technology subsector, which everyone um, shows the most interest. And um, a key part of this as well is that it's scalable to include other cluster-based strategies, software, healthcare, whatever it might be. Um, so if one subsector becomes uh, fading or if new ones emerge, that it can adapt to those. And finally, um, it gives the, the city the ability to create and seek create and seek investment and funding opportunities, um, whether it's lobbying uh, state and federal uh, organizations for Pittsburgh, which a lot of other cities have been successful in, or just working with what's here in Pittsburgh, um, 
whether it be with accelerators, venture capitalists, foundations, or universities, um, in creating some sort of symbiotic relationship in a clean tech development strategy. And the second alternative is uh, for the city to support the creation of a clean tech greenhouse. Uh, this uses the familiar language of the Pittsburgh Life Sciences greenhouse, um, but it could be very different in scope. And part of this is that um, it's a member-based member organization and operates at the regional level, not just within the city. And uh, an important part of this is we're finding the scope early on because some of these different subsectors within clean technology might have disparate goals or objectives, and it's important early on to make sure that those are focused. And the city's role in this would not be to choose these subsectors again, but merely to convene relevant actors. And in addition to this, uh, the city could establish the clean tech greenhouse as a priority formally and provide ongoing visibility for clean tech greenhouse initiatives. And some functionality that could exist within this clean tech greenhouse that we've observed with other regional organizations in other cities is connecting members with one another to improve knowledge transfer, identifying specific clean tech investment opportunities. This has already been done with the Water Economy Network. How can we use, how can we use regional impediments such as combined sewer outflows or shale gas wastewater management um, as an economic development asset. Uh, third, advocating for clean tech priorities and working to implement some of the demand side recommendations that we'll have. Um, advocating for clean tech, or, sorry, um, marketing the clean tech cluster. Um, an important part of this is getting stakeholders together to be uh, using the same branding language for whatever this uh, subsector is. Measuring the magnitude and progress of the region's uh, clean tech cluster through a, an industry database, and then supporting startup and member companies through consulting and accelerator services and potentially engaging with universities for innovation challenges. Um, but one key obstacle with an organization like this is that they are expensive. Um, typically, they operate with an annual budget in excess of a million dollars. Um, and most of these successful organizations have had a uh, diversity of funding um, that's been available to them. Um, but once the city is able to secure that funding, it seems like the infrastructure is here to move forward with a greenhouse. Thanks, Kenny. Um, I'm going to talk about the demand side now. So if, uh, we went back, we go back to that framework. Yep. Uh, Kenny talked about recommendations that would increase the supply of clean tech, local clean technology here. And I'm going to talk about five different ideas we came up with for how the city can encourage local markets here. So the first idea was to offer expedited per permitting or recognition programs for green infrastructure. And when I say green inf infrastructure, I mean rain barrels, green roofs, porous sidewalks, that type of thing. So right now there is not very much incentive for property owners, either residential or commercial, to include these types of green infrastructure on their properties. But the city can help change that by offering either expedited permitting so that developers see a benefit in adding it to speed up their timeline or individual property owners get recognized in some way with like a lawn sign or some badge of I am a good homeowner to encourage them to include these things in their properties. Second idea is to revamp the city's RFP procurement and uh, choice process. So this is two ideas in one. One idea was recently implemented in Philadelphia and I think, and our team thinks that it's a good idea and should, we should consider it here. And that's called an improvement RFP. So they say, we have a social problem and we know that there are technologies out there can, that can help this problem, but we don't necessarily know what those technologies are yet. So we're going to put out an RFP that says, this is our problem, this is the general idea of what we're looking for, and then see what kind of uh, bids you get back and go from there. The second part of revamping the RFP process would be to reconsider the characteristics and weights or importance given to the characteristics when choosing which contractor to go with. So right now the city heavily weighs the age of the contractor and like the agent experience and um, their experience working with the city in the past. And although those are definitely good characteristics, it might leave out newer innovative companies that could add value to the city. Third idea it would be to coordinate some kind of local contractor training for local contractors to learn about the newest, best 
local green technologies. So right now there are a lot of resources being put into energy efficiency in the city, either through auditing programs or energy efficiency loan programs, but we're missing part of that supply chain by not getting those local contractors in on this because they're the ones who are in people's homes every day. They're the ones recommending what products people should be putting in their homes. So we're recommending that the city co coordinates with organizations like Green Building Alliance to hold these trainings to get contractors to know what, what are the best green technologies they should be putting in people's homes. Fourth idea would be to develop green infrastructure guidelines within the new Department of Permitting, Licensing, and Inspections. So right now, this, this kind of goes back to the first one I talked about, but right now the timeline for green infrastructure and development is pretty long because there is not a coherent guideline for how to permit bioswells, porous sidewalks, that types of thing. So we think the city should, could work with industry experts on creating a permitting process so that when a developer wants to include green, green infrastructure in, in their projects, they know that it's not going to increase their timeline to development. And last, we think the city should require utilities to share aggregate neighborhood level data on water consumption and energy consumption on a regular basis. And this data is useful for two main reasons. First, like I said, there are a lot of resources being put into energy efficiency efforts. And if we know where people are using the most energy and the most water, those resources can be very targeted and um, have the most bang for the buck. And then second, that data is really important because we could create a neighborhood competition. So Pittsburgh has really strong neighborhoods and we could use that to our advantage by having a neighborhood competition of who is the most energy efficient, who, who, uses, um, who is the most water efficient. And we could even use our uh, city council members to cheerlead for their district being the most energy efficient or any, any of us. So I, I gave you quickly, very, very quickly, five demand side strategies. Um, but overall, our recommendations are to, for the city to be introspective and say, how much effort do we want to put into focusing on clean technology? How much resources do we have for this right now? Create an internal office of strategic investment or support a, a separate industry membership organization, the Pittsburgh Clean Technology Greenhouse. And then also, in addition, use some of these demand side ideas to create local markets here. Thank you. So uh, we can go through some quick, quick questions, but before uh, we go into some questions, I'll be remiss to say if we don't uh, have another acknowledgement for Latrenda, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Latrenda Leonard, the Deputy Chief of Operations and Administration here in the city. I um, just want to let you know that I'm a resource for you. Anything you need, um, contact city. I have some cards here. Um, our Deputy Director and Director of Public Works are also here. Um, we're very supportive of your work, so let me know if you need anything. And I have some cards I'll leave with Tara or Deborah. Thank you. So are there any uh, questions before any, any questions um, for this group? Who, can the group stand up, actually? Who's the group here? Everyone, and just a round of applause. Right there, right there, right there. Any questions for this team? Did, did you make any evaluation of which? Did you go any further in terms of your evaluation about which parts of clean tech might be? You, you noted that some other municipalities had, had taken a particular piece of clean tech as their focus, and you recommended that we have a focus, but did you actually go to the next stage and actually think about what area of clean tech was seemed most likely for Pittsburgh? The, the clean energy part of the equation seems to be more complex than the other two. Um, in interviews, it was identified several times that it's difficult to, to divorce clean energy from a broader energy strategy, um, that their voice might get drowned out by everything else that's going on in Pittsburgh region. Um, so it seems like that sort of strategy would have to be implemented very differently than would a building technologies or uh, water economy strategy. Um, but with that said, it seems like the other two subsectors seem seems pretty viable to pursue either of those. 
Any other questions? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. is, is there a interested in this is a lot, you know, I know that from a health perspective, there's, uh, in terms of getting that neighborhood aggregate data, there's privacy concerns which limit the information data you can get for health. I actually don't know that that would be the same. Are there any issues like that, to the best of your knowledge, vis-a-vis -vis energy demand and so forth? Because when you take a group as small as a thousand, is there any question about privacy for energy use and that kind of stuff? Not that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean there isn't. I'm just not aware of any. Okay. Yeah. Just curious as we, you know, the follow through on this recommendation, some things, some uh, the unintended uh, sort of surprises that may come along the way. I look, but those are all things to address in the next next phase. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and obviously, uh, this group is around for any follow up questions, and we'll be working with this group and all the groups later on in terms of uh, follow up work. Um, you might have noticed that some of these recommendations will probably also be revealed in our next um, capstone project. So with that, I'll let Grant introduce. Great. Thanks again, and thanks for the Carnegie Mellon class. Uh, the next group that we have is Assessing City-Owned Properties in Pittsburgh. This group was led by Dr. David Miller from the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs and spearheaded here uh, within our department by our, our colleague, uh, Laura Meixel. So uh, with that, this group has taken a look at a city, a variety of city property information that currently resides in a variety of different departments. And what the team has been able to do is to aggregate that information into a synthesized database that is easier to view and also has provided some really significant recommenda recommendations for us to consider uh, as department leaderships with regards to how we manage data going forward. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite up um, uh, excuse me, Rick Hopkinson and Ellie Newman uh, to present the Assessing City-Owned Properties in Pittsburgh. So, Rick, Ellie? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ellie Newman, and this is Rick Hopkinson, and we're here from the University of Pittsburgh's GISPIA program, and our project was inventorying um, 303 city-owned properties. So where we were when we started, um, the city had a very fragmented and sort of decentralized system for managing its buildings. So, you know, different departments had different spreadsheets or websites where they kept various information, but if something changed in one department spreadsheet, that information was not updated across the whole city. Um, and so they realized that this was really holding them back as far as, um, you know, seeing how they could reduce energy use, seeing how they could operate more efficiently and things like that. Um, so that's where we came in. So our goal was to take this very fragmented system and create an integrated, um, integrated database um, that would synthesize all of that information. Um, so the deliverables that we came up with, one was the database. We also did a codebook and database manual. We created a GIS map layer, and then we also did some preliminary uh, energy analysis and benchmarking report. Uh, so this is a screenshot of my laptop when I opened everything that we got at the very beginning. So as you can see, um, some of these spreadsheets, one of them just had firehouses and the years that they were built. One of them had um, some energy information and addresses, and some had energy information um, on a website. So it was really all kind of, you know, all over the place, really. And so we went from this to this new database system. Um, so this is just a, a snapshot of what the database looks like. Um, this here is one of the police headquarters, and you can see that we have a photograph. We actually had a team of students that drove all around Pittsburgh and took photographs of all the buildings that they could find. Um, so I think we have pictures for something like 150 buildings. Um, and then there's different tabs within this. So one of them has building usage, so what departments use the building, how many square feet, things like that. Um, and another one is energy information. Um, we got energy information from the city's portfolio manager energy benchmarking website uh, for the year 2013. Um, so this is a uh, snapshot of what the code book looks like. Um, so oftentimes if you outsource a project like this, um, you get this new piece of software or what have you, and then you sit down to use it and realize that you actually have no idea what any of this means. And so we didn't want that to happen. Um, we created a code book that goes variable by variable and explains how we got the data, where it came from, any flaws or any problems with collecting the information. Um, and then the manual piece of it 
explains how to use it. So if someone isn't as comfortable with access and they want to just have a spreadsheet, you can easily export just the fields that you want um, and take it from there. If you decide you want to add more fields or things like that, the manual explains exactly how to do that. With the energy data that um, the city has through Portfolio Manager, which is a way to record um, their, their energy usage through their energy bills, they create what they call um, energy usage intensity, and that is normalized by the square footage of the building, so it makes it comparable. And this is just a shot of the different um, energy usage intensities of the different buildings in, in the city of Pittsburgh. And then we also create a GIS map that um, sort of plots um, the highest and lowest um, energy efficient buildings in the city. So notice up here the Medic 10 that's pretty high. I think we put um, the top five, the top five biggest energy consumers. We actually labeled on the map all over Bathhouse, um, Shenley Park, Skating Rink. Um, go ahead. And like Ellie alluded to, um, most of our time spent with this project was really um, creating this database um, and, and creating three unique identifiers that the departments can use to um, search for buildings and compare across departments. So you have the building code, you have the parcel ID number and the lot and block number. Um, but we also wanted to provide the city with some recommendations on what they can do to move forward to um, you know, in increase um, their energy efficiency. So that's where sort of some of the benchmarking came in. So we looked at some different cities um, across the United States um, who have already passed um, energy benchmarking disclosure ordinances. And we also looked at a couple international cities. What we found was a lot of the cities in the United States, um, although they have really ambitious goals um, that are admirable, so a lot of them want to reduce their um, greenhouse gas emissions by, let's say, 80% by 2050, um, there's really no clear path um, on how to accomplish that. So that's why we looked at the Toronto report. We found um, the Toronto report being the most interesting um, they, they created in 2014. And that actually, um, they use what they term performance-based conservation. So what they do is they divide all their different publicly owned buildings by type. So, so they classify them. So like you see right here, these are um, all the pools and pool buildings. Um, this is for the city of Pittsburgh. And why they create these use classi classifications because some of these buildings, I mean, they're inherently different, right? You know, the pools aren't going to um, use the same amount of, or have the same type of use as, let's say, fire halls or even an administration building. So this allows them to sort of benchmark these buildings um, against each other. Um, we go to the next slide. And we also have firehouses here, too. Um, and we also created a, a, a national uh, median for these buildings just so the city sees where they compare um, from a national standpoint. Um, the, so the Pittsburgh median for firehouses is 154.6 um, EUI, and the national is 154.4, um, so extremely close. And the city of Pittsburgh's doing very well with their um, firehouses. But you do have these buildings um, down here that are basically consuming more energy than you know, they, they, they probably should. So go to the next slide. So what Toronto does, um, and the city can decide how exactly they do want to benchmark, we do recommend um, you know, these different use classifications. But Toronto benchmarks to their top 25% um, of energy performers. So what Toronto would want to do and what the city of Pittsburgh might want to adopt is try to get all of these firehouses um, to that 112 EUI, that last, um, that last building over there. So mainly to summarize our findings, um, so we, we highly recommend this performance-based conservation because for us it, it's a really meaningful way to um, benchmark th uh, the buildings. Um, it's also important to ensure all the data is accurate. I think we did a pretty good job with classifying the buildings, but of course, you know, all the department heads, they know, they know their buildings the best, so they might want to just, um, you know, make sure that they're comfortable with those classifications, um, maybe rearrange some classifications so, so you can um, have a meaningful starting point. And then finally, um, sort of goes without saying, but focusing on the really high impact projects, like those, for example, those firehouses that are the worst performing, you want to get them up to speed first and you know, save some dollars. And then that could possibly be, um, you know, the, those monies could be segregated into like a special revenues fund. Um, the savings can be transferred from the general funds um, and that could possibly fund um, future initiatives. So as far as um, the next steps go for the city, so if the city was going to do a capstone with the University of Pittsburgh, again, um, we would recommend maybe creating a team to dig a little bit deeper into some of these use classifications. So 
again, I'm going to talk about you know firehouses or maybe even police stations. Uh, you might want to get a team to actually go out and visit some of these buildings and see what are some characteristics of the lowest performers and the highest performers. Um, you know, you might find that the, the, the low performers are in need of some capital improvements, or you might find that um, it's actually behavior or cultural modification. So just like turning out the lights or maybe switching to LED or something like that. Um, and, and I think it would be a nice pilot um, before the, they, they do their full launch and, and a good learning experience to pick one department. So we want to thank the city for the opportunity to work on this project and we um, are happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Question. Yes. Hi, my name is Jim Sloss, Deputy Director of IMP, and I had a question about the database and its expandability. Uh, what kind of fields uh, are, are within and, and, and what, what are we looking at? Yeah, I mean, the database is your tool, so anything that you think is useful, you can add. Um, it's helpful if you can add fields that have building codes already attached, because that's kind of the, the one thing that was constant across all of these fields. So we had um, 2013 total energy use and energy costs for the full year. So if you wanted to do a monthly average or if you wanted to add historical energy data, that's something that can easily be done in just a few minutes. Hi, I'm Kaz Pellegrini, project manager um, of the architecture division in Public Works. I just want to compliment you guys on your project because of uh, what I saw several weeks ago. I was really nervous about what you might come up with <laughs> because I thought I was going to get plastered with lots and lots of data, but you did an excellent job in making it visual too, and it makes a really um, easy job of my group pinpointing and Henry Cafardi's group, the facilities division, pinpoint those buildings we need to attack mm -hmm. in a glance for next year's uh, budget and subsequent years. So great job. Thank you. Thank and I you. hope we can get a disc of that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So with that, we'll go to our final presentation. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for coming out today. My name is Dana Robinson. I'm a Network Analyst 3 for Department of Innovation and Performance. And I had the pleasure of working with this fine group here uh, from the Carnegie Mellon Heinz College. Uh, the project that they're working on was the Pittsburgh Public Wi-Fi Project. Um, what that project did was explore the feasibility of having free citywide Wi-Fi for the different neighborhoods within the city. Um, we have today, uh, who spearheaded it was Professor Sakir Yusel, sitting right there. Um, we have Lindsey Parham, we have Terry Gibbs, and we have uh, Kati Nalabolu. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to have Lindy, Lindsay come up and uh, she'll explain some things to you. Thank you so much for, for coming to view our project on the hybrid Wi-Fi framework. Um, we, thank you again to Dana Robinson. He was invaluable throughout this entire semester on helping us prepare this, this presentation. Um, as you know, we were working with the City of Pittsburgh's Department of Innovation and Performance, and they came to us at the beginning of the semester saying, we really want to look into the feasibility of municipal-wide Wi-Fi. Um, is it feasible? And if it is, what's a, the best implementation plan? Um, and so that's, we spent the entire semester um, researching and coming up with applications for the City of Pittsburgh. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk a little bit about problems with the municipal Wi-Fi model. Um, then we're going to discuss our solution to those problems, our hybrid model framework. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on each of the frameworks that comprise the entire hybrid model solution, which is cost analysis, asset mapping, um, network design, and security. Then we're going to go into some of the potential issues with implementing um, this particular mo model, and then some next steps and solution, next steps and recommendations for the city. So we spent the, um, the initial part of the semester um, discovering problems with municipal Wi-Fi models. So these red triangles represent all the failed municipal, large-scale municipal Wi-Fi implementations over the past 15 years. Um, what we found is, by and large, 
these models, these Wi-Fi implementations fail. And they fail because they're usually supported by one or two initial stakeholders. Um, the demand for that is very, very low. Um, they anticipate the initial demand for a municipal or free Wi-Fi network to be about 30 to 50 percent of the population. So they anticipated 30 to 50 percent of the population would log on to this free Wi-Fi. In actuality, we discovered that about 2 to 3 percent of the population will actually log on to the Wi-Fi. The, but the cost of this municipal Wi-Fi is still the same, really, if to, regardless of whether um, you have a hundred thousand users or a hundred users because the the equipment costs will be the same so the investors backed out of these municipal Wi-Fi implementations because the the demand just was not there um, I'll go into the next slide but what we did notice was small community and neighborhood Wi-Fi models have been successful um, all over the country and so we we did case studies of why they were successful and we came up with three main traits why um, three main traits of successful community implementations. So all successful community implementations have a clear objective. Um, they have appropriate demand. They've already calculated that the, de the demand will be there to support the network. And they start really small, at particularly in a pilot area. So a clear objective, a lot of the objectives, example objectives would be economic development or social, social good. Um, and then they determine the demand by, you, by a needs assessment. The demand, usually in these small community models, um, the demand drives the network. So the demand or the problem is there, and then the network acts as the solution. And then additionally, they don't start on a large scale. Um, municipal Wi-Fi networks fail because they try to cover the entire city, um, the entire city, and that's just that's too expensive. It doesn't give them, it doesn't allow for time to test or for time to do a, to um, improve the network plan. So community, community networks are, are very small, and they start on a small scale. Next slide. OK, so we came up with a hybrid model, which is a, a combination of both the community networks and a, the municip municipal Wi-Fi network. It's a brand new idea that, we, that we, um, we thought of to both combine this community network, but then also the needs of the city, because the city does have an invested interest in getting Wi-Fi access across the entire across the entire um, district. So a community model, as I said before, is a community-owned and funded Wi-Fi implementation that the city provides resources to. So the city, whatever resources the city um, has available to them, they make available to the community networks. So it's a series of small-scale and neighborhood implementations that on a, combined together cover the, ma the majority of the city of Pittsburgh. So we, we decided that these these implementations should use mesh network technology. And we decided on mesh after looking carefully at multiple other, other implementations. Mesh is great because it's affordable, it's easy to use and maintain, and most importantly, it's scalable. Uh, our, our hybrid model relies on both bandwidth sharing and the traditional purchase ISP. Um, bandwidth sharing is, like for example, you have a large company and they have X amount of bandwidth that they either don't use every month or they're willing to donate to the, com to the network. That alleviates a good deal of the cost off the network, both st the initial cost and the maintaining costs. Okay, so why this model is great for the city. First, I should talk about a little bit of the constraints and requirements that the city, city had initially. First of all, the city is constrained by a very limited budget. Um, additionally, the city would prefer to outsource the maintenance and um, the maintenance of this network to a third party. The city was also very clear that it had to be scalable. Even if we start in a small area, we need to be able to scale this network out to reach all the, all the residents. Um, security is also a very important concern. In order for the city to put its name on something, it has to have a minimum security standard. Um, also legal. They didn't want to do anything illegal. Um, how we needed to look into <laughs> the legality of implementing a Wi-Fi system. And, and it's funny to think about, but actually a good portion of our, present, of our, our, um, of our research was focused on this, this particular law that, that was unclear whether or not the city was even legally allowed to open up a municipal Wi-Fi um, implementation. Um, a lot of other cities get sued and they invest tens of millions of dollars into a network just to have incumbent ISP providers um, take them to court. So it was a, a huge consideration. Mm -hmm. So why our model fits all those requirements and constraints is the community funds this model. 
the community, the owners of the community network would be the primary fund, um, would provide the primary funds and finances for this model, but the city will help them identify grants and identify grants that meet their objective to offset some of the costs. Um, the maintenance of the model would also be on the, the network owners. The, the scalability, it really, we've really created a flexible framework that, that can be applied to not just one area, but the entirety of, of Pittsburgh's individual neighborhoods. The security, we've set a standard baseline security model that all networks would have to comply to if they were trying to utilize city resources. Um, and we looked into the legality of it and we are fairly, we're really confident that we're not overstepping any federal or state laws. And also since the community would own, the community network owners would own the model, the city would not be held liable. Okay, so where community models are already working. So these are not examples of hybrid models, but they're examples of um, public access Wi-Fi throughout Pittsburgh. So it's not a big stretch to think that more communities would be interested in implementing their own Wi-Fi implementations. We have wireless Shadyside. Um, uh, all of Walnut Street is connected in Shadyside with free Wi-Fi hosted by a hotel. Um, the Downtown Pittsburgh Partnership, as you know, provides limited access Wi-Fi, and then Wireless Waterways provides wire access, to, access at the waterfront. Okay, so what did we deliver? We, we delivered what I call a, a hybrid Wi-Fi framework, and within that big framework are smaller templates and frameworks that give give you all the tools you need to create and implement a Wi-Fi model, this particular Wi-Fi model. Those frameworks include a needs assessment, um, asset mapping, cost analysis, network planning, security and operation standards. Um, yeah, so those are the, the individual frameworks. And during this presentation, I'm going to talk particularly about cost analysis and asset mapping. Okay, so like I said before, a lot of a lot of um, municipal Wi-Fi networks fail because they start too large. We applied our framework to a small pilot area of East Liberty just to show that this, this is a feasible, a feasible model that can actually be applied to neighborhoods in, in Pittsburgh. So we chose East Liberty as our pilot area for, um, because it has a lot of ch um, economic development opportunities, particularly I think of the Target project, when I think of economic development opportunities, the city has already invested in this area, so having that, that, um, that strong pull is really great for the sustainability of a network. There's also, it's rich in resources and businesses. We looked at the City of Commerce website and there are hundreds of businesses located within East Liberty. Those businesses can act as access points for internet, so it was important that there are businesses. Um, it's a manageable size, it's about a half a square mile, and it has 6,000 6, residents, as well as people coming in and out to take advantage of retail and um, shopping. And then there are a lot of nonprofits and social, social groups there, so it's, um, it's, rich in, it's rich in assets, and that's why we chose it as our pilot area. So, Asset mapping, the idea of asset mapping is identifying the, the large business stakeholders in the area, um, both large businesses, small businesses, nonprofits, and pu public services. So these green dots represent the businesses. Um, we, we used the ArcGIS and some of the GIS data from the City of Pittsburgh's um, website, but then we had to add additional, additional entities onto this map, upload it, and we have identified, we've identified them here. So this is just a cutout of East Liberty. Oh, go ahead. All right, so this is, um, we took the access points, we identified these businesses, and these are the access points where we would set up mesh network, um, mesh network equipment, and the circles represent the buffer zone. And so these, um, these yellow dots here would be where we would have our internet gateways. So this is where you're getting the ISP. These are, represent large businesses that would most likely share bandwidth to this network. Um, each. Small businesses and city light posts will host nodes. Those nodes will provide inter as internet access points. And um, as you can see, we're covering the majority of East Liberty up to there towards the north. Up to there towards the north is mostly residential. And because the objective of this was economic development, we were not able to cover that area with um, bandwidth shared resources. So then we talked about funding options. Funding is obviously a, a, huge, a huge component of, um, of a municipal Wi-Fi network. Um, we would work with the city to have, we worked with 
with the city to identify grants and donation bases and crowdfunding sources for this network. So it wouldn't just be the community network footing the bill. They could rely on grants, donations from this, the businesses in the area, and then of crowdfunding is, is a new popular way of, of, getting, of getting money for an initiative. We all, so we took an example. We plugged in East Liberty to our cost analysis framework, and we decided that um, about it would cost $113,000 to create a mesh network in East Liberty, 90,000 of which would be dedicated towards labor. So if the city was somehow able to offset that labor cost, it would be much more feasible to start this network at a lower, at a lower price. Okay, so some potential issues and then the next step. So the biggest issues with this particular model is incentivizing stakeholders to invest. So part of the majority of the way we get our bandwidth in order to lower the cost is by bandwidth sharing, particularly through hospitals, universities, um, big retailers like Target. They would have to share their bandwidth to offset the bandwidth cost. Um, incentivizing them to do, the, do so could be an issue. Also, we picked East Liberty because it was really rich in resources. Some areas don't have as many resources. Um, some areas are more residential. How would you kind of equalize, equalize that so they also have access to um, municipal wi or Wi-Fi? And then, of course, this model is untested. And so there's kind of the trials and tribulations that happen with an untested model. So the city of Pittsburgh's role, I talked about a little bit about what the city of Pittsburgh could do throughout this, throughout this initiative, but most of but most importantly, I think they need to act as a congregation point for information. There are so many rich resources out there on the web that aren't t that could help um, each of these networks really lay out a framework for how how they can implement and at what cost and what's worked and what hasn't worked. But it's not together in one point. So if the city could perhaps create a website that brings all those resources together, that would be the most important thing that they, they could do. As I said before, next steps, create a website, and then we've also, we've also done all the legwork for creating a, a municipal Wi-Fi implementation in East Liberty. The next step would be to actually create it by reaching out to stakeholders and gauging their interest and getting them involved. Um, I want to thank everyone. I would like to thank everyone for um, listening to our presentation, and again, thank you, Dana and Deborah, for all your help this semester. Wi-Fi team stand up? Where are they? Right here. Any questions? Yes. Uh, actually, maybe you explain this, but I actually am not clear on the demand side for this because okay. with the example of the, the failed municipal mm -hmm. ones where you anticipated it was 25 to 40 percent or something like that and it actually was 2 to 3 percent, and I'm wondering whether, uh, I, I have some ideas about why that was, but, yeah. uh, but I, I'm wondering whether this is, in it, whether there actually is demand, say, in East Liberty if you looked at you know, the, the anticipated users and so forth. Uh -huh. Part of our framework is doing a needs assessment, which is one of the very first things that you should do because um, a lot of municipal Wi-Fi networks did fail because of that demand piece. A lot of the community networks, they're built because the demand already exists. Um, a lot of grassroots movements happen be organically because of the demand and the problem is already there. Um, this would just be kind of a different way of helping those networks along. And we would, we want to base these community models off of different purposes. So the demand would be based on the purpose. So if we, in Sadie Liberty, the purpose was economic development, we would assume that the businesses would rather share their bandwidth and reduce their costs than paying for their own internet. And if it, the purpose was uh, education in a certain community, then the schools could lower their costs by doing that. I like your approach, and uh, I think it has, has great merit. Have you ever thought about kind of switching the model from areas that have a relatively high demand, mm -hmm. um, like you know, areas that are developing economically, like East Liberty, for example, um, where users there may already be a high demand, relatively high demand. Have you thought about focusing on areas where there's little or no demand, yeah. but the value could be that much more exponential in its value? Yeah, that's, for that's parks, actually a, for example. That's a huge aspect of our. <laughs> <laughs> or for new communities, like or new old communities, like a community like Larmer, 
for example, that's adjacent yeah. to East Liberty, where you used to have 16,000 families there. Now you have 1,600, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but the community is coming back and developing. Wouldn't it be a, a wonderful kind of driver uh, and an, an amenity to have uh, Wi-Fi for the community even before it's kind of fully formed? So that that's actually one of the biggest hurdles from our presentation when we were just um, trying to decide why municipal Wi-Fi failed, was failing across the board, and we decided it was because of low demand. We had to look at why why the demand was so low, and it was because people had a lot, the majority of people have ready access to bandwidth in their home or at work, and they also have cell phone data plans. And so we said, we decided, well, how do you, how do you then put it in an area with more demand? And people who don't have access to cell phone to cell phone data plans and don't have municipal or don't have um, at home Wi-Fi. So that would be um, the target. The t those areas would have the most demand. Those areas are also the poorest areas within Pittsburgh. And so if you were to put um, Wi-Fi in communities that were had low employment rates, high high school dropout rates, single single mother households, you would get the highest demand because they just don't have access to broadband in any other way. With the model that working under the constraints of it has to be um, it has to be low cost. You have to also consider, okay, consider who's going to pay for it. So in these areas where they're economically depressed, there's no one to pay for the, this particular model. But then also, conversely, they have the most demand. So we're doomed. No. <laughs> and there's also an issue of whether uh, the people in those areas have devices to be able to use mm -hmm. the service that we would provide. Yeah. We we actually came up with a we came up with a map that showed these target areas where it turned out to be some of the poorest areas in Pittsburgh. But then they ha they don't have the cell phone to connect to the data, they don't or to the internet. They don't have the laptop to connect to the internet, and it brought up a whole other issue where you would have to get them the device to connect to your product. But there were a few programs by schools where students were given iPads as well, and we were hoping that these neighborhoods were around. Yeah, no, no, I think it's a great, I mean, your approach, I think, is valid. Uh, but uh, the one institution that has um, kind of universal uh, appeal and is geographically distributed throughout, th throughout the cities are parks, though. And I know there's no community there yeah. who lives in a park, but the, about 90% of the people in the city of Pittsburgh use parks um, over the course of a year or th you know, a few months. And it might be a, an interesting point uh, to think about that as almost a public utility, um, because it, it's becoming that way. If it's not already, mm -hmm. we're not already there yet. Do we have the data on cell phone or uh, uh, portable device uh, ownership? Unfortunately, we don't. So how we calculated that was we had to take a national statistic mm -hmm. and then apply that to the demographics that we have on Pittsburgh. So right. like. Um, age and income demographics and we had to match that with the national usage. Because it, it does seem there is a sweet spot for need which is actually communities that actually have the portable devices mm -hmm. but in fact you know but are operating them on the type of plans that don't have a cellular data plan and I think that, and that that's where there's sort of like there's no opportunity to get to the actual to the internet without a broadband you know without this kind of Wi-Fi thing or you know or the or a, or a business that has it and so and that seems like where you'd have a really intense kind of Demand. So, uh, can we target those? Um, our biggest, on our biggest constraint was both the f we had to come up with a model that took into consideration also the financial constraint. Yeah. And so, this hybrid model is a is a reflection of that. Right. Finding ways for other for communities to pay for it, and right. and if it's a community that, um, so we would have to almost redo redo our thinking if those funds became available. Can I ask another question? Have we mapped, can, is it, do we, can we, do we map cellular phone, cellular phone usage in the city? That will be our next capstone. <laughs> and excellent. Yeah, because that's, that's also sometimes used as an indicator for certain types of uh, innovative neighborhoods, et cetera. So mm -hmm. anyhow, thank you. Any other questions? So you can see we, we were able to sponsor a pretty diverse set of capstone systems projects and, and obviously behind each of these students projects is a really strong faculty sponsor, uh, faculty administrator so I'll be remiss without thanking them. So will you all stand up?
please, and allow us to thank you, Dr. Miller, Dr. Fang, everyone. And obviously, uh, again, a really strong partnership with Carnegie Mellon University, Rick and Paul and Canu. Please, thank you so much. Let me stand up. Um, and I just want to, again, thank uh, another person who's been behind this, Tara over there, Matthews, who's been uh, coordinating these efforts, sending you lots of emails, uh, missed finals and everything like that. So thank you so much, Tara. Um, one more round of applause for all the students. Can we have all the students stand up, please? Um, this is, this is really important work. I think I spoke to all of you and said, you know, the work that you are doing in terms of research has real world implications to what we're seeing in the city, um, from public works to city planning to city parks um, to innovation and performance. Um, very valuable thinking, and, and you can see from each of the director's questions, they're really thinking about how it, to apply it in terms of their practice and policies. Um, we, in terms of next steps, do you see a, a continuation of, this pro of these projects and these works um, towards next semester in terms of uh, how we can actually take some of these recommendations and deliver. Um, so these recommendations have been really valuable to us um, and we really couldn't do this without each of your efforts and your work. So thank you so much. Thank you um, and I think that closes everything. So.